so far in circular motion. Uh, we've looked at the fact that if we've got, and we really spent the bulk of our time on uniform circular motion because that's what most of it is. And when it's non-uniform, you can't do as many interesting things with it. In any kind of circular motion, you've got to have some kind of centripetal force. Centripetal force, remember what that means? It's facing toward the center, right? We looked at this and we said, well, that, that force that's acting toward the center, right, it can come from a variety of things. It might come from um, tension in a string, some kind of medium like that, right? It might come from, if this is like, you know, a celestial body or planet, something like that, that force might come from gravity, okay? And we noticed that it had to be just the right amount of force. It had to be m r omega squared or, or m v squared on r, right? What would happen if it was just a little bit too much force pulling toward the center? What would happen? It would spiral, it would spiral in, that's exactly right. Um, this force is just enough to change the direction of velocity so it goes around in this curve, but if it's too great, it'll change it too much, right? And it'll start to go in with it, in with it, and if it's not enough, conversely, what would happen? It would spiral outwards, right? It would go wee, and it wouldn't, it wouldn't get caught. Okay. So, these are the two ideas that we've been looking at, right? But I have this question to you, right? Uh, we were talking about strings with tension or um, planets with gravity. We actually observe, though, many things that move in circles like this, okay? But there's no string holding the thing in, and there's no gravity necessarily holding it in. Uh, and the, the easiest example I can think of is one of these. Ooh. Oh, that's terrible. Sorry. Right, so here you go. Here's a car. <laughs> You're like, oh, that's what it is, right? If I have a car and it's, um, well, let's just say for the sake of simplicity, um, it is doing laps around a circular track, okay? Now, quite obviously, if it's a normal sized car, there's no string <laughs> with tension holding it toward the center of the track, right? And at the same time, we assume there's no enormous body exerting gravity on the car that keeps it on the track. So how does it go in a circle? What is the force that keeps it faced towards the inside? Any takers? And the answer is it's friction. Now, hold on a second. We're kind of used to we're kind of used to the idea of like, even when we move around, right? Friction is kind of what slows you down. You, you, you roll something and then eventually it will stop because friction will, will stop it, right? Well, the idea is that friction is mainly a reaction force, right? When something's pushing against something and the friction will push back, okay? Now, what's happening is this car is going around, okay? Well, according to inertia, right, the first law, which way does that car, with all of its inertial mass, which way does it want to go? Is it at, there's, there's two options for inertia, right? It's either going to be at rest, is it at rest? No. Or it'll be uniform straight line motion, right? So what it wants to do is not bend around like this, it wants to keep going, right? So the normal sort of situation is, the default situation for this car is, um, is this kind of situation, right? So it's going outward. So therefore, the friction force, it's reacting against that, right? And so there's a sideways force acting toward the middle and that's what's keeping it in the circular path, right? Now that is why it's so important that there is, um, there is grip on the tires and on the road, right? Because if you take that grip away, then what happens? There's not enough friction, right? This will take over and it'll skid outwards, okay? So, that's why, you know, rainy conditions or if the tires on your car are really old and bald and don't have enough grip on them, then you're gonna have this, you're gonna go off in the direction of the tangent, actually, that's where you're gonna go. So this is kind of a problem, but we sort of overcome it with tires. But there's another way to overcome it. There's another way to overcome it. So road designers take advantage of these things called, and here's our, um, here's our final thing, what are called banked tracks. Banked tracks. Okay. A banked track is where you are turning around, right? What they do is they put an embankment. They raise part of the road, not all of it, okay? So that 
it is a force acting inward, okay? I want you to remember the ball, the enormous two meter across hemispherical ball we were looking at, right? Okay, we were looking at this yesterday, right? We noticed that, well, okay, you've got this circular path being traced out. You do have, well, we had a, um, a string up here attached which was exerting tension, right? But then there was another force involved that was also pushing in. Which force was that? was the normal force, right? So if this is where I am, you know, the normal force is going there, perpendicular to the surface of the ball, or perpendicular to the surface of whatever you're on, um, ball, the cone, all those kinds of things, okay? So the bag tracks take advantage of this. Let's draw one and you'll see what's going on. First, we'll do it side on, so you do a little sort of triangle like this. Okay, now this is a bit of exaggeration. Um, you almost never see a bank track that is this steep, but if we make it realistic, it's hard to see what's going on. Okay, so instead of the road being flat, okay, part of the road, the outside of the turn, is embanked up. Okay, and then this thing it curves around. Okay, so there's the turn. So we're looking on from there. Just to make it a little bit clearer, I might put in there's an edge here that we can't see, this outside bottom edge of the embankment. So if I dot that, uh, went a bit high over there. You can kind of see what's going on. Okay. So what's happened is as we go around this turn, okay, there's going to be a normal force, right? The normal force is going in that direction. So you can see when we resolve it, right, it'll have a vertical part, right, but it'll also have a horizontal part that is centripetal. It's headed toward the center of the turn. So this is going to help our car stay on the road and not do this thing. Okay? So to understand this situation and know what's going on, let's put a bit more um, detail onto this. So catch up, draw this diagram, and let's start to label some bits onto it. We've got our normal force there. What's another force that's acting on this thing? Gravity, good, so let's put that on. Okay, there you go. Now, it's, um, it is circular. You don't need to have all of, I mean, you know, we talked about a car doing laps around a circular track, but that's not usually what's happening. Usually we want to actually do a turn and not just go round and round and round. Okay. But there is still, for this arc, right, there is still a center to this, okay? Now, watch out. There's, a couple, there's lots of different centers that I can talk about here because there are lots of different circles that I could draw. For instance, here is a, um, a center of the circle and it's on the flat of the ground, okay? Not on the high and banked part, right? But it's not very useful to us. This, this particular center is not very useful to us because if you're driving along in your car, right? So here's my car. And um, you're driving along this road, okay? The center of the mass of the car, right, should be on the center of the road. And that's why I've drawn my object and all of the forces acting on it. I've drawn it at the center there, okay? Now that's raised off the ground. Can you see that? So therefore, I'm going to raise the center that I'm interested in also off the ground. So something like here, I'm guessing. So there is the actual center of motion. If I picture a horizontal circle now, and it lines up like this. This would be the radius. is the radius of the actual circular motion. Okay. Uh, I'll mark that as the center. Okay. We need to know what angle this is embanked at. So I'll call this angle over here theta. This is at a right angle. Um, we've got a height here of the raised edge. And then lastly, we need to know the width of the road. So we'll call that d for distance. 